Asthma is a chronic ongoing disease that flares up from time to time. Now because it causes inflammation which persists, it's really important that asthma reviews or asthma checkups are done from time to time and not just at set time periods like once a year. Now it's also important that these reviews are done by people who are appropriately trained for this role and who've demonstrated their competence to do so. Unfortunately, particularly in the United Kingdom, these asthma reviews are often delegated to individuals without adequate training for this role. My own experience, as well as being a general practitioner for many years, included my role as clinical lead for the UK National Review of Asthma Deaths, called the NRAD, which was published in 2014. And subsequently, I've served as expert witness in a number of coroner's inquests into preventable asthma deaths. Now, I've been concerned about inappropriate delegation of asthma reviews and asthma care by doctors to people without competence for this role. So why am I talking about this today? It's all got to do with safety, and that's safety for patients and also safety for doctors who put their careers at risk by inappropriate delegation. I'm really concerned that patients as well as primary care doctors in the United Kingdom are at grave risk. Patients are at risk because their care is being increasingly delegated to people without training or without adequate supervision. And patients may not always realise that the person doing their asthma review is not adequately trained to do this job. So people with asthma need to ask when they're having an asthma review, whether they're seeing a doctor, and if not, what qualifications this person has to do the asthma review, and also whether they are supervised by the doctor in the practice. Then there is the grave risk for doctors, because firstly, they're exposing themselves to complaints when things go wrong for patients who've been seen by an untrained individual. And also, because their roles are being eroded by new changes in healthcare provision, and this currently in the United Kingdom is focused on access to information or to consultations, irrespective of the quality of care provided. Now, ultimately, it's the doctor who takes ultimate responsibility for their patient's care. They carry the can when things go wrong, even if they are seen by somebody else who's been delegated to do so by the doctor. In addition, doctors, and I'm referring particularly to uh, primary care doctors in the United Kingdom, where systems are being imposed by government and healthcare managers, which the doctors feel that they have to comply with. So while today's topic affects care for people with many chronic diseases, I'm focusing on asthma care as an example in the hope that colleagues in primary care will see the writing on the wall and find a way to ensure their roles as doctors, for which they've spent many years training, are not eroded by um, really silly management decisions. Now before I continue, please do follow this podcast so that you are alerted every time a new episode is published. The UK system of primary care was in the past the envy of the whole world, where people could see a doctor who knew them and who knew their families without paying for this at the point of care. In the past, GPs could refer their patients without any hassles to see a specialist of their choice when this was needed. Sadly, this is no longer the case, where GPs are overworked, they've got limited access to specialists without jumping through many administrative hoops. And in the years that I've been a United Kingdom general practitioner, there have been many changes in the structure of primary care. A major change came in the 1990s, in in 1990, um, to the GP contract, where GPs were reimbursed for running chronic disease clinics in their practice, where the focus was on mainly diabetes and asthma. In the following 10 years, as a result, there was sufficient funding for training nurses to a high level of competence in asthma care. 
so much so that in the late 1990s, 80% of nurses caring for people with asthma had diploma-level training, and this helped to ensure patient safety. The problem then was that general practitioners were becoming de-skilled in asthma care because the care was delegated to and was being provided mainly by highly trained, competent nurses. Then in 2020, things started going downhill. The quality outcome framework, known as the COF system, came into force, where GPs were reimbursed for increasing numbers of medical conditions, all requiring recording of data, which could be checked by the authorities, which mainly served the purpose for validation for payment and not necessarily for quality of care. And this happened without provision of adequate resources or access to specialists. So care was being moved out of hospital, where there is specialist expertise, into primary care, where most doctors are generalists. Sadly, in the case of asthma, the COF incentive scheme has been reduced in 2023-24 to a tick box exercise where only four asthma data items need to be recorded on computers in order for the doctors to be paid. These items are first to maintain an asthma register. And this register will only include patients over six years old and including those who are not, sorry, and excluding those who are not prescribed an inhaler in the last year. The second criterion is a recording of the percentage of those diagnosed with either a record of quality assured spirometry and either peak flow or pheno. Now these need to be recorded within three months before and six months after the diagnosis is recorded in the record. The third criterion is the percentage of those people with asthma who have had an asthma review in the last 12 months including an assessment of asthma control using a validated questionnaire such as the asthma control test or ACT, which is it, which it is known as. It also requires a recording of the number of attacks um, and a inhaler technique check and provision of a personalised asthma action plan. And finally, the fourth quaff requirement for payment requires a record of either personal smoking status or exposure to secondhand smoke in the previous 12 months. Okay, so what's the problem? You might say that these four criteria are all valid criteria for managing asthma. Well, it all depends how they are performed and how they are recorded. Now, it should also be noted that GPs are penalised for not recording this information in the records of those people who have a diagnosis code for asthma. So they become careful not to code the word asthma in the records unless all the criteria are met because they're going to be penalised. Then there is a major flaw in this system where only people with a diagnosis of asthma, i.e. a diagnosis is recorded in the notes, would be recalled for a review each year. You may say, well, that's okay because you're concentrating on those people who need a review. However, someone who has asthma, who has defaulted from their treatment advice, and who stopped taking their medication, will be excluded from from being offered a review. And most importantly, those without a recorded diagnosis, even though they may have asthma, are not going to be invited for reviews. In fact, in England, we have nearly half a million children prescribed inhalers without a diagnosis of asthma. So this criterion for COF will apply even if those children are admitted to hospital for an asthma attack, which may not be diagnosed as such in the primary care records. Now we come to my major concern and the focus for today, and that is inappropriate delegation which is featured in the new General Medical Council requirements for doctors who are practicing medicine in the United Kingdom. 
Essentially, the issue is this. Training and a level of competence and expertise is required for all four of those COIF criteria. And this expertise includes a clinician with knowledge about all of the possible patterns and causes of respiratory symptoms, that's cough, wheeze, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. Now this is required as well as a detailed knowledge of the diagnostic criteria for asthma as well as the numerous other conditions that could present with these symptoms in order to make an informed diagnosis of asthma and to exclude the numerous other causes for these symptoms. What about quality assured spirometry? Now this requires access to the equipment that needs to be properly maintained and calibrated as well as someone with certified training and competence to perform the test. And furthermore, because asthma inflammation fluctuates from day to day, the test needs to be performed on a day and time when the person has airflow obstruction in order to demonstrate that reversibility with the bronchodilator in a post-bronchodilator test. So there needs to be some flexibility in the system where appointments for spirometry are offered, which there isn't, as far as I'm aware, and certainly from my knowledge, well, my local knowledge. So people are sent an appointment for some future arbitrary date without follow-up for the spirometry tests, which may be normal on the day, and then someone competent needs to be able to interpret the results together with the medical history. Then, in addition to either pheno or peak flow variability, um, these are also required in order to make the diagnosis and to record it. Now with regard to pheno, pheno is not a diagnostic test for asthma. It is a test for type 2 inflammation, just as much as a raised eosinophil count is a test for type 2 inflammation. So many GPs have been made to believe that if a pheno test is negative, Asthma cannot be diagnosed. What nonsense. However, pheno is very helpful in diagnosing whether someone is not adhering to their inhaled corticosteroid treatment. However, most GPs don't have access to this test. While I'm on this topic, not enough use is being made of peak flow charts. A peak flow chart done over a period of two or three weeks can be very helpful to demonstrate reversible airflow obstruction, and this is not used often enough. Then we come to the requirement for an asthma review. While it's very good that objective assessment of asthma control is included for reimbursement, most asthma care clinicians don't understand that the ACT, the asthma control test, only confirms whether the person is currently controlled, i.e. their asthma is controlled within the previous three to four weeks. That's all that that test tells you. The crucial question relates to whether the person has had an attack in the last 12 months, and this is important because asthma control is defined in two domains. That's current symptom control, tested using a validated test such as the ACT, and I emphasize the word current, i.e. that means the control is reflected for the last four weeks only, and also risk of future attacks, which is determined by whether someone has had an attack in the previous 12 months. Of course, there are other risk factors, and I describe these in more detail in podcasts number 10 to 57. So please do listen to those. And then the review in order for payment for COF must include an inhaler technique check, and that requires considerable expertise, because most healthcare professionals do not know how to use all the types of devices prescribed. And finally, the review, also for payment for COF, should include a personalised asthma action plan, which again requires a detailed knowledge of the individual person's asthma, the use and purpose of their particular drugs that have been prescribed, their triggers, how to recognise flare-ups or attacks is also required, and most importantly, what action to take when asthma goes out of control, as well as how and when to seek urgent medical advice. So clearly, in order to provide a personalised asthma action plan, 
This requires considerable knowledge and expertise on asthma. And the last point regarding smoking, while smoking records may be recorded in the notes, it's uncommon for family, re- family members to have their entries in their records of passive exposure to smoke or other noxious gases such as from vapes. So how on earth have we got to the point in the United Kingdom where someone with a little general training, not necessarily in asthma, can be delegated to care for people with asthma, which is a potentially life-threatening disease, and to perform all the tasks required for payment that I've listed above. Sadly, from my own experience, when my wife and I got our asthma reviews last year by a text message from the practice, asking for an ACT score and a link to an inhaler technique video. I suspect that most of the cough items are simply ticked by someone who's asked a patient, so how's your asthma today, mate? It's just not good enough in my view. So in summary, I do know that general practitioners are extremely busy. However, they do have responsibility for caring for people who may or who do have asthma. And I hope that you will reconsider before delegating care of your patients to someone who may not be adequately trained or supervised. So the key messages are, anyone with responsibility for seeing people who may present with respiratory symptoms should have a working knowledge of asthma and the other possible underlying causes for those respiratory symptoms. Secondly, GPs should not, in my view, expose themselves to risks by simply complying with managers' demands that patients should be directed to remote hubs for advice or be delegated for asthma reviews by persons who may not be adequately trained or supervised. Thirdly, anyone who is delegated to care for the different aspects of asthma, and that includes diagnosis, treatment, reviews and dealing with attacks, should be competent for the role they are expected to perform and should have access to adequate training and ongoing supervision. Now finally, this is a mammoth hurdle and a massive task that we need to address in the United Kingdom. And I have suggested a way forward in my seven-step plan for reviewing asthma in all those who have had attacks in a regular practice meeting where all staff can learn about asthma. Please see the link to this plan in the description below.